Good afternoon. My name is David Andalfaro of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis here at the 38th Annual uh, Public Policy Conference at the Fed. And I have as my guest here one of the presenters, uh, Larry Cristiano of Northwestern University, who's going to be presenting a paper that's called Leverage Restrictions in a Business Cycle Model. And we're very uh, fortunate to have Larry here. He's agreed to sit down and talk to, to us uh, and explain to us uh, what his paper is all about and why, why, uh, why we should find it uh, interesting. Larry, would you like to give us the rundown on your paper? Well, one of the, things that, one of the many things that we learned as a result of this uh, uh, recent crisis is that the, the banks can actually be, the banks can be a problem in the economy. Uh, before 2008, 2007, uh, most people thought that uh, all banks are rock solid and that if we're looking for vulnerabilities in the economy, uh, the banks are not part of the picture. But that changed uh, with 2008. And to think about this more, you have to think about what do, what do banks do? And so what they do is they, they, they borrow short term uh, and they lend long term. And there's something inherently uh, uh, dangerous about that because if short term interest rates go up uh, a lot, then the banks could be caught, uh, actually could go into bankruptcy. And if the banks go into bankruptcy, because the bank, the banking system is a lot like the air that we breathe uh, in the economy, if the banks go down, uh, we're not going to be breathing any air, the whole economy will go down. Virtually every uh, relationship uh, in the economy is mediated somehow by a bank. If you're, if you're working for a firm, your, your pay is going to be um, a transfer to you from that firm uh, by a bank. If you buy something, a bank's involved. A bank is involved everywhere uh, in every economic uh, relationship. And so if we, if we uh, see that the banks are getting uh, risky and, and vulnerable to being going out of business, uh, then we really have to be concerned. Now, as I said, up until recently, no one was worried about stuff like this, but uh, people have become increasingly concerned about this, this possible vulnerability. So that brings me to this issue about le leverage. Mm -hmm. uh, leverage has to do with how much banks borrow, how much they borrow relative to what they have. And obviously, the more a bank uh, borrows, uh, the more, uh, just like an ordinary person, uh, the more they borrow, the more they're at risk of uh, being caught short. And so uh, there's been a lot of thinking about how it is that maybe banks borrow more than they than is good for society as a whole and how it is that we should perhaps uh, rein them in and and this reining in is called leverage restrictions so the question is from a policy point of view what kind of leverage restrictions should we place on banks and, um, and the, the answer is complicated because uh, it has to do with what's healthy for the economy as a whole which means you have to understand exactly how the banks kind of work in the, in the economy as a whole. And uh, for example, in a recession, um, there may not be enough credit flowing uh, to the economy. And uh, we may want to take that into account when we restrict how much borrowing banks do. Uh, we, may, we may be willing to tolerate a little bit of riskiness in the banks because there's a benefit to credit flowing in a recession, perhaps. And so to think about what the right amount of restriction on banks uh, should be, we have to balance off the riskiness on the banks on the one hand with the desire to provide a lot of credit to the economy. The fact that the answer to the question how much credit, how much leverage restrictions we should have on banks involves thinking about the economy as a whole makes it a very complicated problem and requires that we adopt a global a global perspective, we have to think about the economy as a whole, and that's what gets us to models of the economy as a whole. And the paper that I'm talking about today is such a model. Can I uh, ask you, um, wh why in your view can the, say, free market not be relied on to generate the correct uh, amount of leverage? Why, I mean, the title suggests that there's a propensity for the uh, private market to over leverage. Yeah, so this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is absolutely critical. Mm. For, uh, if any, anybody is to think about leverage restrictions, uh, they had better do it in a framework where such things are desirable. Mm -hmm. uh, if I want to think about how, much, uh, how many umbrellas uh, we ought to build, it should be in a world where there we take 
uh, into account that there can be rain. And similarly, in the case of the, the um, thinking about leverage restrictions, we, we really need to do it into an environment where we put our fingers on exactly what it is that would make the banking system issue too much leverage in, if there were no regulation at all. And so uh, in economics, we have many uh, examples of how it is that markets might break down. Um, and uh, those examples, uh, well, they're, 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 well, the obvious example is pollution, for example. If, we, if a firm uh, generates pollution uh, when it's producing, then and no one uh, forces a cost on the firm for that, then uh, we can expect too much of that activity be, to be happening. So in this paper, for example, uh, we take a very particular position on what it is about the banks that leads them to issue, in the absence of regulation, uh, too much uh, debt. And uh, that's what people call, uh, in fancy words, uh, financial friction. Uh, the idea is that banks, um, the job of banks is to go out and find good uh, uh, lending opportunities, uh, but that that involves uh, efforts that are not observable to people, and that's what gives rise to uh, the market not being necessarily uh, uh, able to, de to deliver the best outcomes. We have a number of examples of this. You know, for example, healthcare is much in the news these days yeah. as an example uh, for various uh, interesting reasons uh, that have colorful names like the death spiral. Uh, that we have various discussions about how wide is it the market might not generate the right amount of uh, health care. And we, similar examples are used to think about how it is that why it might be that banks in an unregulated market might issue too much debt. Your paper is a theoretical inquiry uh, with application to the United States, I presume. Yeah. Uh, but have you looked at cross-country evidence? Um, no. Canada, for example, do they have more uh, severe leverage restrictions? Uh, our, our, what we've been doing so far is to try to answer your first question. Okay. We've uh -huh. been trying to think, you know, what kind of a framework it would be useful for thinking about this. And, it ha and in particular, we're interested in answering the question, uh, we, we want to, what kind of framework uh, has the property that you would have the banks issuing too much leverage? And then we're asking more related questions on like, is this framework that we have in some loose sense look like the data? Uh, but in terms of really digging in yet, uh, we're very hopeful that we can use this model to do that. When you're saying look at the data and when you use the term banks, yeah. do you mean literally banks or do you think more broadly to include those, those uh, activities that occurred in the so-called shadow banking sector? Yeah, I mean the, um, um, a, a, a bunch of the, not all of them, but a lot of the problems that we talk about are, are not so big when it, in the context of the commercial banking system. Mm -hmm. Um, but so we really do have in mind the shadow banking shadow system banking, sure. when we're talking that about less this regulated stuff. sector, and, and that, that's exactly the place that uh, that was thought to be uh, the source of the problem in, in 2008. Mm -hmm. In actual fact, if you look at the commercial banks in 2008, they look beautiful. Mm -hmm. It was actually the rest of the banking system that was that was performing very badly and and doing damage to the economy. But it was. It was hard to see that because since they're not heavily regulated, mm -hmm. there's not much data on them, and so you didn't see them very well, much. Well, the commercial banks have the Federal Deposit Insurance yeah. as well to protect yeah. the downside. And the, and the deposit insurance, to a large extent, gets rid of the problems that we're talking about, although not entirely, mm -hmm. uh, because there are stockholders that look like ordinary lenders in the real world, uh, namely people who hold preferred stock. Mm -hmm. People who pref hold preferred stock from the point of view, our model look like uh, ordinary lenders. In terms of, uh, does your model have anything to say then in terms of uh, the most recent uh, crisis? If, if we had had more severe uh, um, leverage restrictions in place, would much of the worst uh, impact of the uh, most recent recession have been avoided or mitigated in some way? Well, manner? so one of the, yes. Um, so one of the uh, problems that the model highlights is that if banks have too little net worth, if, they, if, the, if the assets that, that belongs to the bank gets too small, then that interferes with the ability of the bank to do their job, which is to send funds from savers to uh, investors. And uh, in the case of the 2008 crisis, what it looks like is that uh, 
what made 2008 actually different from, say, 2001 is precisely that the, uh, the wealth of the banks themselves went down with the collapse in housing prices. Uh, this is different from 2001, for example, where we had the dot-com uh, bust, and banks were not heavily invested mm -hmm. in that, so they did not suffer a big reduction in their own uh, resources. But 2008 is very different because they were heavily invested in houses. That is, they had bought a lot of mortgage-backed securities. Those dropped in value, and that interfered with their ability to, uh, to conduct their business, to, to move the uh, funds from savers to investors. What would have been the costs, if any, of having these leverage restrictions in place? Uh, can you quantify it in terms of uh, would it have reduced growth over the period? Uh, well, I mean, so is this something our, your model could potentially... No, in our analysis, yeah. um, the leverage restrictions actually make the economy stronger. Ah, okay, there you go. The best so, of all worlds. So um, what it is, it's, <laughs> it's like pollution. Uh -huh. So from a point of view of the individual bank, uh, they don't internalize all the costs of issuing all this debt. And, uh, and, uh, and actually, for an individual bank, uh, there are not big costs. But if they all do that simultaneously, uh, it does damage to the economy. That's why regulation, that's, that's why uh, the market doesn't work, because the banks are not getting all the right signals themselves. Just like the polluter is not get. there's no market mechanism for a polluter to get a signal about what costs they're imposing on other people. Similarly, in an unregulated market, banks are not getting all the signals about what are the consequences of all the borrowing that they're doing. There's no market mechanism for, for, for warning them of, that they're issuing too much debt or something like that. I see. So uh, well, one, one final question then in terms of, again, does, in, does your model speak to the, the, the role that these uh, leverage restrictions might have had, say, in terms of the evolution of real estate prices or the real estate price bubble? Um, well, I mean, this is stretching it, but, yeah. but in the model, what happens is that if the economy does go into a collapse, it can be self-reinforcing. As the economy goes down, the value of assets go down. That makes the banks worse. That makes the economy go down more, uh, and, and, and so on. So, um, I mean, this is an example of why banks are so important, because they're right at the heart of the economy. If something uh, goes wrong with those things, the uh, bad stuff can happen. And the model does capture that idea. Apart from uh, policies that determine uh, leverage restrictions, yeah. uh, does your model have anything to say about uh, what the fiscal authority or the monetary authority might do in an emergency situation? I mean, given that we've had the leverage yeah. regime in place, something bad happens, is there yeah. some desirable... Uh, Stop get measure that well uh, so far um, the way the model works is um, in some respects it falls into a general pattern of models uh, that says that uh, recessions can be excessive the economy in a recession may go down uh, too much uh, the 2008 2009 uh, episode in the United States I think there's general agreement that Things went down, uh, went down too much. And so what the model says is that anything you can do to stop that from happening is a good idea, uh, if you can. So for example, in terms of monetary policy, it what it would say is that you, under circumstances where the re uh, there's a recession developing, it's a good idea to cut interest rates. And that's roughly what the, uh, the policy actually is. Uh, right now, that policy, of course, has been short-circuited by the, by the lower bound on the interest mm -hmm. rate. But my, my guess is that all that this will do is add to the reasons why uh, monetary authorities ought to be stabilizing the economy. Very good. Well, I think that uh, just to wrap up, I mean, um, what's the takeaway? I mean, if you had to summarize what your paper's about in kind of two or three bullet points, what would you say? What it's about is that regulating the banks is, is probably a good idea, and uh, a f completely free market when it comes to banking is probably a bad idea. Very good. Thank you very much, Larry. Appreciate it.